In this part of our discussion now, I am going to try and look at various kinds of experimental research designs that are available to us. Why do I use the word available? Because you have to also see the practicality, the convenience, the ethics of conducting certain experimental designs. If that were not so, one would have always gone to the true experimental designs. But sometimes it is not possible to do them. So, I am going to look at broadly three kinds of designs experimental or true experimental designs, quasi experimental designs and pre experimental designs. All these are excellent ways of trying to explore a particular variable divided down into a number of different factors, levels, all these now are terms that we have become quite familiar with. But there are minor differences in the way these experiments are executed, in the way this research is executed and we are going to examine these fine differences. Let us look at the true experimental design first as I have been repeatedly saying this is considered to be the gold standard of science, the gold standard of experimental design where all the variables are perfectly in the control of the experimenter. We did say in the past that this is basically a very logical positivist perspective because we are looking at cause effect, exploring cause effect relationships amongst all these different variables. So, let us see what are the various factors that you find in a true experimental design. First of all, you have to have randomly assigned subjects. There cannot be in any way any kind of pre-selection bias to our subjects. Then you have to have different levels of the variable allocated to the different experimental conditions in a very controlled manner. Hence, one can be very sure that one particular group is getting exactly that particular level of the variable, no more, no less. What we are also doing is very carefully measuring the dv or the dependent variable, the outcome variable, which actually is the, occur is the result or the impact, reflects the impact of this independent variable. So, that is really what one finds in a true experimental design. There can be some variations in this. Sometimes you can have what we call a repeated measures design. In a repeated measures design, the subjects in that experiment are put through the same conditions several times. So, all the subjects in the experiment get all the various levels and that is called a repeated measures design. In its way, it kind of inducts its own control into the experiment because it is the same subjects that keep appearing again and again at various time frames. So, in a repeated measures design you will of course need to use a different kind of statistical analysis as we will see later. For example, an ANOVA that you do will have to be a repeated measures ANOVA and so on. One can also use time series designs which means that along the way as various measurements are being taken of a particular group, one sort of injects an experimental condition between different two different time points. So, one can very accurately see the impact of that experimental condition as it is introduced into the time series. So, these are some of the very effective experimental ways in which you can actually draw a causal inference one can actually make a connection between the independent variable or the IV and the dependent variable or the DV. All of these require very accurate control, very careful control of all our experimental conditions. Now, let us move to some of the quasi experimental designs. Why are these quasi experimental designs called so? Why is this term given to them? because they are in a way almost experimental designs, but they are not perfect experimental designs. So, what happens in quasi experimental designs? First of all, one cannot sometimes get a perfectly randomized subject pool. Sometimes it is not possible to select for certain subjects as we wish using a random number table. So, you have to take the subjects as they occur or you might take them through some other fashions of sampling like snowball or convenience sampling, incidental sampling. So, in a quasi experimental design this is permissible. One can select subjects using one of these different modes. So, put very simply the quasi experimental designs actually pretty much follow the different parameters of an experimental design leaving aside the randomization aspect. Hence, the experimenter does have pretty good control 
over most of the conditions but cannot claim that the subjects were completely randomized. Sometimes one can use what we call a counterbalance. So what, what one really does in this condition is you expose two groups to certain conditions. So group 1 gets certain conditions and group 2 gets certain conditions and then you change them over. So the group A goes to the position of group B and vice versa. These counterbalance designs can also be a good way in which you can kind of correct for many of the internal, the threats to internal validity that we may have in an experimental design. But nevertheless, they are not really a true experimental design. So counterbalance designs can be perfectly acceptable. Sometimes what we also have in these kind of quasi-experimental designs is what are called a non-equivalent control group design. So what are we saying here? We are actually declaring that we have not established equivalence of the two groups to start with. The example I took for you earlier of two divisions of a class, right? We can say that these are non-equivalent groups in the sense that we have in no way established that the capacity of the experimental group and the capacity of the control group along the parameters of interest to us are in any way equal or equivalent. So this becomes a typical quasi-experimental design because we do not have that kind of control over absolutely establishing equivalence between the two groups to begin with. So non-equivalent control group designs, counterbalance designs, all these actually become quasi-experimental designs which give us the advantage of a lot of convenience, a lot of ease in our experimental procedures. But the disadvantage is of course the accuracy payoff one is not able to draw conclusions with as much accuracy as one would do with a true experimental design. And finally, we will describe what we call pre-experimental designs. You will be a little surprised to know perhaps that even a single case study can definitely function as a pre-experimental design. A lot of good science has been built on very well taken single case studies. So one can use a really interesting case of any sort, it could be a psychopathology of some sort, it could be a certain species if you are studying life sciences, anything can really function as a single case study. But this actually is a pre-experimental design. We just looked at a one shot case study. What is done over here? That subject that you have picked is actually studied at one time point. One can also have a case study over a time series. So you can actually examine that single case subject over and over again over a specified time series. This also qualifies as a sort of pre-experimental design because you are interested in seeing how changes occur over this subject over time. What sort of behavioral changes, what sort of performance changes actually happen in this subject. In some cases, one can do what is called a one group pre-test, post-test design. This is also a pre-experimental design. What are we doing over here? We are actually taking a particular group at hand, establishing a baseline, measuring how they perform at baseline then introducing the independent variable, the condition that we wish to actually impose on this group. Then we again take a measurement from this group on the same dependent variable that one has already measured at baseline. So now what we can do is the group becomes their own control and you can actually compare pre-test with post-test. So this is also a very interesting and a very useful design that you can use to try and see the impact of so many things. This can even be used maybe in the marketing sphere, in the advertising sphere. So you can study purchase behaviors of a certain sample, of a certain cohort initially. Then you can introduce your advertisement, introduce your marketing strategy. And then you realize that, oh, this behavior, purchasing behavior, buying behavior of this cohort has actually changed. So single subject time series, single subject one shot designs, these kind of pre-test, post-test designs for a single group. Sometimes you can have a static group comparison. So what you do is you take the groups in situ. Okay, maybe you are comparing different organizations. 
So you will have say a family run organization, you have a professionally run organization or you might have a multi uh, national kind of organization. So you, these are static groups, you do not really have the choice to randomize or to select subjects, but those static groups in themselves are very interesting. So you can have a pre-experimental design which is focused on these kind of groups. This is a quick review of how we can have true experimental, quasi experimental and pre experimental designs and yet produce very valid results provided you have taken care of all the internal threats to validity. We are going to now briefly talk about external threats also to validity. As we realized many of these true experimental designs are very very accurate. Right? But sometimes you cannot really generalize them to the real world outside. That is because you have created such an artificial setting in the laboratory while conducting these experiments that you cannot actually draw conclusions and say the same findings will hold in the real world outside. Whereas for the, quali for the quasi experimental or for the pre experimental you are actually taking situations the way they are in real life. So your generalizability might actually be better. Hence, what we are looking at is that in experiments, in research, experimental research, we actually have to sometimes have a payoff. It is like a tightrope walk between falling over on the side of internal validity and being very, very careful that each and every condition is absolutely foolproof, but then you may lose out a little on external validity. Or one might go with very real life conditions. An excellent example of this is the field experiment where you are actually going out into the field and yet conducting an experiment. This has excellent generalizability in the outside world. But one has to take care of all the internal threats that might happen. So these are all the decisions that an experimenter has to take while conducting experimental research. In this final part of our discussion, I am going to take a short peek at how exactly these different experimental designs pan out in terms of statistical analysis. Because finally after having amassed such a wealth of data, we want to process it, we want to make meaning of it. So I am simply connecting for you using two or three examples because this is not a lesson on statistics. How exactly we would process or crunch the numbers that come out of the various experimental designs that we use. Let us take the example initially which we took of two completely different groups, an experimental group and a control group where they are being exposed, they are first been matched or they have been completely balanced to ensure their equivalence and then one group is getting the experimental condition and one group is not getting that experimental condition. In such an event one would do an independent t-test because what you are trying to do is compare the means of the first group with the second group. If in contrast you had just one group and you were taking two sets of measures from these groups. For example, if you were looking at say a sports team and their performance on a running event and on a jumping event or if you were looking at a school class and you are seeing how well they read and how well they spell or some two tasks. Then one would have a kind of t-test where you do not have independent group comparisons, where you are actually looking at dependent groups and the same groups, two different scores are being compared in this t-test. That is the kind of choice you would make. Sometimes in the experimental design, one might have three levels of the independent variable or even more levels of the independent variable. In such a condition, rather than using a t-test multiple number of times, one would choose an analysis of variance. And this analysis of variance would have this factor presented at different levels and then you can draw conclusions statistically. If you have additionally another variable which you want to co-vary out from this entire data, you might use an analysis of covariance. If rather than having one dv you have multiple dvs, you might decide to have a multiple analysis of variance, a MANOVA. So depending on the experimental design you actually choose, you might decide to shift 
over to a different kind of statistical analysis. So I just used all these different examples to highlight for you how closely tied together is your statistical plan and your actual experimental plan. So friends always be very aware before you actually begin your data analysis what exactly you were planning to do with these numbers that you have obtained. So friends finally after all this discussion of all the various factors that play a role in research designs, experimental research designs, let us really look at what an experimenter should do when he plans his experiment. Let us just walk ourselves through the various steps. Obviously the first very important step would be selecting a topic. So you should look at a topic which fits well into this experimental paradigm that we have just out, outlined in front of you. Obviously one would have a bit of a positivist perspective in this entire exercise. So look, choose a topic, look carefully and find a domain which can well lend itself to this kind of a experiment. After having selected your topic, you will need to decide what kind of design exact, exactly you want to subject all the participants of this experiment to. In order to do this, you will also have to have a good mastery over the topic. So a, an excellent literature review, a very careful literature review is a must. One must go into all the findings that different scientists have come up with in our own country, in other countries, recently some of the classic researchers of the past. Because as they say in science, we always stand on the shoulders of other scientists, on the shoulders of giants. And so we need not reinvent the wheel. We need not do again what other people have done. And therefore a good review of literature would be a very good idea. Having done this, one must then begin to start generating hypotheses. One might have one tailed or two tailed hypotheses where one is actually drawing or taking a stand, drawing upon past literature and saying that from my experiment, these are my expectations. This is the way I expect my data to pan out. Hence, selecting very carefully our wording for our hypotheses is very important. So having selected our topic, having determined on our research question, having planned our hypotheses, of course, a complete literature search, a literature review. Now you are in a position to actually plan your experiment, to lay out your procedures, decide which step comes before which, which tools are going to be administered. And then very, very important, having seen your entire layout of the experimental design, decide which statistical procedures would be best applied. Decide which of these various modes you want to use to control for biases, control for threats to internal validity and then having carried out your experiment, we collect the data and then we subject it to the various statistical tools available to us. Having done all this, we can say that we have successfully completed our experiment. So I think we can end at this point, wishing all of you all the best in good experimental research. Thank you.